Uterine malformations can be attributed to three main pathological origins. These include, first, hypoplasia or agenesis, which leads to either the complete absence of the uterus or the formation of a unicornuate uterus. Secondly, failure of fusion by the malarian ducts, leading to either a didelphic or bicornuate uterus. Or finally, failure of resorption, leading to a septated uterus. Detection and treatment differs for each of the anomalies. The development of the gonadal system begins at the fifth to sixth weeks gestation with the appearance of the urogenital ridge. Female development is determined by the presence of two X chromosomes and the absence of a Y chromosome. At approximately the ninth week of gestation, the ovaries are formed and the Wolffian or mesonephric and malarian or paramesonephric ducts coexist. Absence of testosterone leads to the involution of the Wolffian ducts. The absence of anti-malarian hormone allows for the development of the malarian ducts. The caudal portion of the malarian duct leads to the formation of the uterus, cervix, and the upper one-third of the vagina. By the twelfth week of gestation, the uterus assumes its mature morphological shape, and by the twenty-second week of gestation, the entire process is complete, resulting in a uterus, cervix, and uterine cavity. The American Fertility Society classifies uterine anomalies in seven classes. Let's begin by discussing class one uterine anomalies, hypoplasia or uterine agenesis. Agenesis of the uterus is often associated with either the Meyer-Rokotansky-Kuster-Hauser syndrome, which is a class one uterine anomaly and occurs when no vagina, cervix, or uterus exists, or testicular feminization, in which a blind pouch exists but no uterus or ovaries. It is important to differentiate between these two uterine malformations by way of a karyotype, in which meyer rokotansky kuster hauser syndrome is associated with 46XX, while testicular feminization is associated with 46XY. In order to determine whether surgery is indicated, the removal of undescended testicles is necessary in testicular feminization, helping to reduce the risk of testicular cancer. Uterine agenesis is typically diagnosed at puberty when patients present with primary amenorrhea. It is the second most common cause of primary amenorrhea in adolescence. Ultrasound and MRI findings for agenesis include absence of the cervix and or uterus with a blind ending vagina. In uterine agenesis, no uterine tissue is present. In uterine hypoplasia, the endometrial cavity is small with an intercorneal distance of less than 2 centimeters. Treatment of meyer rokotansky kuster hauser syndrome centers on correction of anatomical anomalies. A neovagina is created most often using vaginal dilators. The patient is instructed to apply pressure to the vaginal dimple twice daily for 20 to 30 minutes using graduated vaginal dilators. Average time for use of the dilators is about 12 months. This procedure is successful in creating a neovagina in more than 90% of patients. If vaginal dilators are unsuccessful, then a neovagina may be created surgically using either the Mackendo or the Davydove procedure. If a functional malarian remnant is present, the menstruation should be suppressed and surgical resection of the malarian remnant completed, preferentially with laparoscopy. Also, evaluation of the renal and axial skeletal systems should be completed. Class II uterine anomalies occur when only one malarian duct develops, resulting in a unicornuate uterus. A unicornuate uterus occurs in 20% of cases involving uterine anomalies. When development of only one malarian duct occurs, then one-third of patients have an isolated unicornuate uterus, one-third of patients have a non-cavitary rudimentary horn, and one-third are found to have a cavitary rudimentary horn, which may or may not communicate with the unicornuate cavity. In this last case, it's often necessary to remove the cavitary horn to prevent pregnancy and subsequent rupture from occurring in a non-communicating horn. Rupture of a rudimentary horn results in hemorrhage with 90% of deaths within 10 to 15 minutes of rupture. Pregnancy can occur in a rudimentary horn, but it's rare. If pregnancy is detected before the mid-second trimester, then abortion is recommended. If pregnancy is detected after the mid-second trimester, then serial ultrasound to assess uterine wall thickness may be necessary. Delivery is recommended when fetal lung maturity is achieved or the uterine wall thickness is less than 5 millimeters. 
Ultrasound and MRI may be used to visualize the uterus, which appears banana-shaped without the usual rounded fundal contour. The uterine zonal anatomy is normal. A rudimentary horn may be observed as a soft tissue mass. If the uterine horn is obstructed, then it may be shown as a complex hemorrhagic cystic structure. Live birth may be achieved in 29% of unicorn uterus pregnancies. While the risk for prematurity is 44%, miscarriage 29%, and ectopic pregnancies 4%. Next, let's discuss malaria infusion problems. Class three uterine anomalies are referred to as uterine didelphus. Didelphic uteruses account for only 5% of uterine anomalies and result from near complete failure of malaria duct fusion. This results in two hemiuteri and two cervices. Uterine didelphus is typically asymptomatic and may be diagnosed at time of initial pelvic exam by the identification of two cervices. With a didelphic uterus, fetal survival occurs in 41 to 64 percent of pregnancies, premature birth occurs in 20 to 45 percent of pregnancies, and miscarriages occur in 32 to 52 percent of women. Cases of twin pregnancies have been reported with one twin in each horn. 2D ultrasound is often used for the diagnosis of a didelphic uterus, showing widely divergent horns. A vaginal septum is difficult to visualize. MRI will reveal two separate normal-sized uteri and cervices. A septum can be visualized and may extend into the upper vagina. Two uterine horns are widely splayed, and endometrial and myometrial widths are preserved. Surgical intervention is typically not necessary with a uterine didelphus. A bicornuate uterus occurs secondary to complete failure of malaria duct fusion, resulting in a uterus with two separate horns, and this is called a class 4 uterine anomaly. This anomaly occurs in 5% of uterine malformations. The bicornuate shape of the uterus is formed by an intervening myometrium extending from the fundus of the uterus to the cervix. This intervening tissue is accompanied by a fundal cleft. The cleft must have a depth of greater than one centimeter, measured by 3D ultrasound, for the diagnosis of a bicornuate uterus to be made. Bicornuate uteruses may develop with a single cervix, called unicollis, or a double cervix, called bicollis. Fetal survival rates seen in women with a bicornuate uterus range from 57 to 63 percent. Miscarriage rates lie within 28 to 35 percent, followed by premature birth rates of 14 to 23 percent. The length of the septum is directly related to the incidence of abortion and preterm delivery, with complete bicornuate uteruses having the highest rates. As mentioned previously, measurement of the fundal cleft via 3D ultrasound is an emerging diagnostic process. MRI and ultrasound are used to visualize the two uterine cavities. The fundus is concave with greater than one centimeter of a fundal cleft. The intercornual distance is also increased to greater than four centimeters. However, unlike many other uterine anomalies, treatment via hysteroscopic resection is contraindicated in a bicornuate uterus. The final anomaly to discuss involves failure of proper resorption of tissue during uterine formation. This may lead to either a septate or arcuate uterus. A class 5 uterine anomaly is a septate uterus. Septate uteri account for 55% of uterine anomalies and result from incomplete resorption of the uterovaginal septum. Serosal indentation may also be seen, but remember, if the indentation is greater than 1 centimeter, the uterus is considered bicornuate. Septate uteruses are associated with the porous reproductive rates seen in uterine anomalies. Studies show there is a positive correlation between the completeness of the septum and the risk of pregnancy failure. The length of the septum, however, does not seem to increase the complication rates. Diagnosis is made via 3D ultrasound. Previous diagnostic procedures included hysterosalpingogram, MRI, and laparoscopy to differentiate between septated and bicornuate uteruses. 3D ultrasound can now be used due to its unique ability to assess the size and shape of not only the uterine cavity, but also the serosa. Treatment relies on hysteroscopic resection, and pregnancy outcomes can approach normal rates once the resection is complete. Note that treatment of a septate uterus is only indicated with long-term unexplained fertility. Class 6 uterine anomalies are arcuate uteri. 
An arcuate uterus can sometimes be considered a normal variant or a true uterine anomaly. Diagnosis is made via MRI or a 3D ultrasound showing a broad indentation seen at the fundus of the uterus. Patients with an arcuate uterus may experience either successful or unsuccessful obstetrical outcome. As with septate uterine anomalies, resection is the treatment of choice, but is only indicated with recurrent pregnancy loss. The final class of uterine anomaly, class 7, is a result of diethylstilbestrol exposure in utero. Until 1971, DES was a non-steroidal estrogen used to prevent miscarriage in pregnant women with prior poor obstetrical outcomes. DES-related anomalies can affect the uterine corpus, cervix, and the vagina. Poor obstetric outcomes have been associated with DES-related uterine anomalies, including an increased risk of abortion, ectopic pregnancy, preterm delivery, and cervical incompetence.